Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at our Eat Your Ethics event. Um, we realized towards the end of the event that we were running out of time, but we had received so many great questions from you all that we wanted to be sure to respond to them. And so we're doing this additional video where we will go through and respond to all of your questions. If you think of anything else after the event or after watching this video, then please be sure to reach out to us via email and we'll be happy to respond to you. With that, I'll hand it over to Erica for her to go through the questions. Thanks, Sharanya. Um, and yes, please feel free to reach out to us via email, um, info at foodispower.org. Um, so hello again. We will start by going through the questions that you sent us. I'll start with like veganism questions, go down to how the event kind of flowed, which was veganism, chocolate, and then just general questions. Um, so the first question I have is, Hello, I would like to go vegan. However, I am already quite limited in my diet because I have to eat gluten-free. It seems overwhelming and limiting to make vegan foods when I feel short on time already as it is. Any tips for people with gluten allergies or intolerances with limited time? I'm not sure if any of you have gluten intolerances. Um, I know Lauren that you have a friend who um, had a gluten intolerance. So if you wanna speak on that or if anyone else, and I feel bad if, <laughs> since I don't know if anyone has a gluten intolerance, but feel free to speak up. Well, I think that, yeah, I have a few friends, including one of our former board members who's vegan, who also had a gluten allergy. And I, I'm not going to act like it's, it's easy because I know it's not. Um, but there are some restaurants um, that do have vegan and gluten-free foods. And I know that there are special breads you can buy and things like that. Yeah, Erica, I don't really know I have that much to offer other than saying that, you know, um, we are working on our, you know, meal planning and things like that. And maybe that's something we can consider is maybe putting some type of asterisk or something like that by the gluten-free options. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. It definitely makes me think that maybe we need to maybe indicate some foods and maybe even some of our recipes that might be gluten-free. Um, so I think more than anything, we may not have advice for you. You may have helped us. Um, but if you want some personal one-on-one, -on -one, let us know. And we can try to reach out to the people that we know that are vegan and gluten-free and see if they've got some good advice for you. That's great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so the next question is, um, today or in the future, I'd love some info on honey and bees and ethics. And so I just wanted to quickly say that in our next event, um, serving number two, we will be talking about bees. Um, so if you can, please do show up for that event. Um, so the next question, it's kind of a two-part question. It was asked a few times during the event, and it's about ranchers claims about regenerative, regenerative agriculture and um, the rotation of cows on the grazing fields. And so um, someone wants to know if the regenerative agriculture movement it has gained a lot of traction recently, as has the argument that small scale animal farming is both more ethical and sustainable for the environment. How do you respond to this? Um, I haven't done a lot of research into this. I know in the end, these animals are still harmed. They're still exploited and used for their bodies. Um, so it's not great. Um, but if anyone else wants to kind of chime in that has done more research on this, that'd be fantastic. I, I don't know which of you has. So please jump in. I mean, I wouldn't say that I've done research on it, but I would say that at the end of the day, when you're trying to look at lessening the suffering or harms that comes to non-human animals, it doesn't really matter in what conditions in which they're raised if at the end of the day, they're gonna be killed. And again, all of these animals still suffer the same transport. They're still gonna be slaughtered. Even the smaller scale slaughter situations are problematic. Um, they still, I mean, it's hard to go into it, right? Like their knives dull and things like that because it's still excruciatingly horrible for the animals. Um, but I do think that it's impractical to think that those types of solutions are gonna be able to feed everybody. And so why not come up with a solution? I don't understand what the um, resistance is to looking to a solution that doesn't harm animals at all. We know it's better for the environment and we know it's better for our health. So it just seems like an industry trying so hard to stay relevant when they just, if they could just accept 
what's better for the environment and our health and not wanting to cause harm to others, that we could be a lot further on in varying amounts of foods and types of ways to feed people if they just didn't stick to trying to make these other systems work. They're still having to feed the animals. There's still an incredible amount of waste. None of that changes um, in this, the size of the system. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Elise. I was just going to add, I know one of the big parts of regenerative agriculture too is plant diversity, which is like not something you need to have animal agriculture for. Um, so one of the big pieces is, you know, making sure that you're um, not doing like monolithic crops, you know, and having one crop. So, you know, those pieces of regenerative agriculture and regenerative, um, you know, gardening can still happen without the, the piece of, you know, suffering of eventual slaughter of animals. So, you know, that's what I would say is there's pieces that you could take from that that might be beneficial. But yeah, you know, um, like Lauren was saying, it seems like the last vestiges of that movement trying to um, somehow input animal agriculture into something that doesn't really even need it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Elise. Um, so the next question is, what are your favorite cookbooks for vegan family meals? I'm just going to throw out there that we have veganmexicanfood.com that is in booklet form and veganfilipinofood.com that is in booklet form as well that has tons of recipes that are uh, tried and true by our team. And so they are delicious for the entire family. If Lauren, Amanda, Elise, or Sharonia, or Ethan wants to jump in and just say their favorite cookbook, I am happy to accept that. <laughs> well, I would also say the plant-based planet cookbook is really awesome. Um, if anyone hasn't had a chance to check it out yet, um, it was, it's a beautiful cookbook coming, you know, that combines recipes uh, from all over the world, it's vegan recipes. Um, and the added bonus is the proceeds are coming to Food Empowerment Project, which is really cool. Um, and then I'll just throw out one other that I really like. There's a small cafe in San Diego that has a cool, you know, I, I'm not a raw vegan by any means, but they have a really cool cookbook called like Funky Fresh and Raw. And I think it's kind of fun to dabble in it. They have great sauces in there and stuff like that. So I like that one. <laughs> Awesome. If no one else wants to go, we will move on. Um, so the next question is, I love the idea of starting with individual food choices, which are so powerful. For those of us already making vegan food choices, do you have suggestions or next steps for other activism or work toward policy solutions to move us closer to a compassionate and equitable food system? And I think Lauren covered this a little bit um, when we were talking about what you can do during our event. Um, but if Lauren, you want, you want to say anything else about this? No, I mean, I think that it's important for anybody to recognize that it has to go beyond your individual choices, that that's one step and one part of it. And um, depending on the issue, that's what it varies on, right? So like with farm workers, we're definitely going to encourage people to support farm worker led boycotts or campaigns. Um, for our chocolate list, you know, we want people to contact the companies. But I would say overwhelmingly is, join your voices with others, you know, look online, see if there's already an organization working on an issue that you care about, you know, join with their campaigns. Um, and again, speak to the retailers about the issues that you care about. So I think in, in policymakers too, um, again, when it comes to certain issues like farm worker justice issues, they're all policy changes. So I think it's, it, it depends on what it is, but more than likely you're not the only one, but if you are the only one, you can contact us and we'd be happy to help you to figure out how to to get others involved. Absolutely. Uh, so the last question in this uh, veganism portion is about animal welfare. Um, so they want to know what we think about animal welfare. And I, and I think a lot of confusion happens with this term um, with animal welfare, animal rights kind of getting mixed up together. Um, so I'm wondering, Shadanya, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I would say you know, given just my past experience and groups that I've worked with in the in the past, um, the, there is a clear distinction, and and I just want to make that absolutely clear. Uh, when we talk about a vegan organization like Food Empowerment Project, we're talking about an organization that 
we base all of our work on that central core value of veganism, not uh, utilizing animals in any way, not abusing animals in any way, not contributing to systems that abuse or use animals in any way. Um, there are groups that, that focus more on improving conditions for animals while they're still in that food system and considered as commodities within the food system. And obviously Food Empowerment Project doesn't support that view because we believe that, and this is something that we discussed during the event as well as Lauren's been mentioning it, but we believe that the system can exist without using and abusing animals. And just improving the conditions or having them on a small farm doesn't change the outcome for that animal. There is still incredible suffering throughout their lives. And we do not believe in that process. And so as a vegan organization, we're very clear that we will, do not contribute and do not support the contribution to that type of a, a welfare-based system, if you will. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything. I'm sorry that I don't mean to talk so much, but I just do. I just wanted to mention that we know that in most social justice movements, there are different roles that everybody takes and, and has to be in a movement, right? So I think that there is a role for welfare organizations that exist out there, but we're just not one of them. So, you know, we know, you know, for me personally, you know, I, it would be too hard for me to work in one of those organizations, but it doesn't mean I don't see some of the value of the work that they're trying to accomplish. But for our organization, we, as a vegan organization, we may take different stances on things because of our mission to be, you know, where we're contributing to the least harm, basically, and fighting for justice and compassion for human and non-human animals. But I just don't want to take away that in every social justice movement, there are different roles that each organization takes, and we accept our role gladly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, you two. So let's move on to chocolate. So the first question is, are there organizations working locally that are helping the children on these farms? Um, and I'm assuming that is Western African farms, as well as buying from the FEP chocolate list, what else can we do? And so I know we covered um, that in the event on what else we can do, but Lauren, do you have any idea about, or Amanda, since you are working on updating the page, do you have any information about people that are actually on the field or on the ground <laughs> in these areas? Yeah, um, so Lauren, you can also feel free to add anything afterwards. I myself don't know that much information about people who are, like organizations that are on the ground working and making concrete change. I do know that the chocolate companies have a lot of initiatives um, that involve like working in areas where child labor and slavery are prevalent. And these initiatives are advertised as helping in some way, um, but are really pretty much just like the chocolate companies trying to act as though they care about what's going on. Um, but these initiatives and actually have been doing research recently on how little impact these actually have on the lives of people in these areas. Um, how the chocolate companies aren't really actually, they say they're reaching lots of people, but that's you know a lot of vague terminology um, and people themselves aren't actually really seeing any change at all in what's going on because what actually needs to happen is that people, um, you know, the cocoa farmers need to be paid more. And if that's not happening, then any initiatives are really just ignoring the problem. Um, there are organizations on the ground, a lot of organizations on the ground in Western Africa, primarily the ones that I'm familiar with are Ghana and the Ivory Coast, who actually are getting children out of trafficked situations. So they're the ones, when you watch these documentaries, they're the ones getting the children out to safety. Um, if you're interested in the names of those organizations, um, we can look them up and give them to you. There's also a company that is working with small farmers, I believe in the Ivory Coast, where they will be the ones to own everything, the machinery, the equipment, they're gonna be able to make their own chocolate. Um, and again, if you're interested in supporting them, we can give them, um, give you their name. Uh, but those are the types of things that we're familiar with in terms of they're really just trying to get the children out. And um, 
to safety and back to their families. Um, and in terms of other things you can do, I mean, I think that, you know, what we have on chocolate is, you know, using our chocolate list, speaking out to the companies, um, but also maybe like look at some of the other commodities that you consume. And we do have information of coffee, bananas and wine on our list as well. So again, it's just a matter of, of thinking more about the foods that you eat and the ones that are commodities uh, and, and how you can make sure to not support bad systems. Absolutely. So yeah, if you would like the names of those organizations, please feel free to email us at info at foodispower.org. Um, so next question, FEP has an amazing list of companies. Does this include companies that also sell cocoa powder? What's the best way to get ethically sourced cocoa powder, which seems harder to find ethically? And so our <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little difficult to answer. Um, we do have companies on our list that produce um, and they have cocoa powder um, or they, they make cocoa powder, but it's not obvious on the list. Um, Lauren, I'm not sure, are, was that part of what we were working on to hopefully get so people can figure out what is what on the list? We, what we've done, I think, is we've offered to email people our breakdown of what the companies do, what they sell. Um, so we can send you something like that that will have them broken down. Off the top of my head, Equal Exchange has cocoa powder. Um, and again, they're probably one of the top ones that we trust. So Equal Exchange, you can order online. Um, and then in the smaller, more health oriented stores, they might sell it there as well. Um, I want to say randomly, and somebody check me on our app and maybe you can put it somewhere that they can see, but I think that Kroger makes cocoa powder that we recommend. I can't remember if that's correct or not. Um, but that's a random grocery store that, <laughs> that sells cocoa powder. Yeah. So we recommend Kroger's cocoa powder. So there's one off the top. It's on the list. Awesome. And just another one that I thought of while I was looking that up is Navitas. I've seen them in different health store, health food stores as well. And it's pretty good cocoa that's recommended by us. Um, so yeah, if you'd like us to send you that list, again, just email us at info at foodispower.org. Um, next question is, can Chavez, Ch Chavez, our chocolate mascot, only be used in vegan grocery stores? I work at a marketing firm for a grocery chain. I would love to bring this up, but it's not a vegan only store. Um, and so we've actually had this question asked of us before. And at this time, it is only vegan stores that Chavez is being put up at. And that's because we only recommend vegan chocolates. Um, so companies that may only make a vegan option but have other chocolates that are not vegan, we wouldn't want them to be advertised as, um, as recommended by FEP because we only recommend, you know, obviously the vegan option. Um, so because it's not an all vegan store, we wouldn't want that to be a mistake that gets made, especially because we rely on volunteers to kind of do all of that on the ground work. Um, anyone else wanna chime in about that or is that, did I cover it? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so moving on. Um, oh, but please feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions. Um, we'd love to connect, especially with you working at a marketing firm, <laughs> be fantastic. Um, so last question for chocolate. Are there any investigations into cocoa, cacao farms, et cetera, in the countries of the chocolate companies that you recommend. Uh, Amanda, I'll pass that one over to you since you're doing the research. I, off the top of my head, do not know of investigations that have been done in the countries, because I know we recommend um, chocolate that comes from areas where child labor and slavery are not prevalent to the best of our knowledge. Um, in these places, investigations. I've been really looking, like combing through everything to try to find, are there places that, since we last updated our webpage, um, where there have been children found, where um, there have been people who were trafficked found. And so um, to the best of my knowledge in the places where we recommend chocolate, any investigations that have been done have not come up with anything, but I actually haven't, I'm not familiar with investigations that have been done either. So Lauren, if you have anything to add, please do. 
Yeah, I think that one of the things that we go based on is the U.S. Department of Labor's report, and they have people around the globe who are keeping an eye on this stuff. So for years and years within Food Empowerment Project, we only had Western Africa on the do not recommend list. But all of a sudden, we found a report that came out in Brazil about what was happening there. And they also then all of a sudden they were also on the U.S. Department of Labor's list. So there are people constantly monitoring these areas, not just for cacao, but for a lot of, again, commodity products. And so um, there are people constantly monitoring this issue around the globe. And that's why our list had to be updated in 2018 to include Brazil. So there are people doing it in companies, in countries where we recommend, and then we have to shift our list. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the more general question, um, someone asked, or they say, I was curious what topics are covered in the next three teaching sessions in this series. And they also say, thank you very much for hosting this. So serving number two um, will be taking place on Sunday, May 23rd at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And that will be covering birds who are raised and killed for food, farm workers, how to lend your voice and more. Serving number three will be on Sunday, August 15th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And that will be covering sea animals who are killed for food, how to fight for the ocean and more. <laughs> I'm just gonna say and more because there's going to be a lot more in each of these segments. Um, and the last serving number four will be taking place on Sunday, October 24th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And that will be covering the humane myth, food apartheid, how to speak up and speak out and our shame on Safeway campaign. Um, so please, if you already, since you already registered for this event, you are automatically registered for all events. So you are free to just come on in um, when that time comes. So the next question is, are there ways to volunteer with your org remotely? Maybe helping to compile slash research other lists. I am in NYC. Um, and so we are always looking for volunteers remotely, especially during this time with the pandemic, um, remote volunteer work is recommended. Um, and so we would definitely want to have your support. Amanda is the one who will be taking over working with volunteers and getting you coordinated on what projects to work on and, and things like that. <laughs> um, so please feel free to go to our website, foodispower.org, and we have an online volunteer form that you can fill out. And once that gets filled out, we'll be able to reach out to you as volunteer opportunities arise. Amanda, do you have anything to say about that? Um, I think you pretty much covered it for now. But thank you. Yeah, look okay. forward to hearing from you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how do you keep your own sanity knowing that even if you are doing your best to not participate in these atrocities, that others whom you know and love are making these choices? How do we stay positive and still fight for these causes? Lauren, there's, I, I can't remember the quote that you have, but there's this amazing quote that you have that we've shared on social media before about how to kind of just stay strong and, and push forward because you're doing, you know, everything you can as, as an individual. Um, but do you have anything you'd like to say about that? I wish I could remember my quote. Um, sounds like it was really good, Erica. Thanks. <laughs> and now you put me on the spot and I'm like, I don't know. Um, well, I'm sure everybody has something to offer here. Um, I think that I, I guess acknowledging that it's hard, especially when it's people that you love. I, you know, I don't know if I, I, gone home sometimes to Texas and somebody would be like, can you pass me that milk? And I'm just like, I'm just thinking to myself, like, oh, the animal, oh, your health. I'm just like, oh, you know, how, how do you not see this? You know, I've been doing this my whole life. Um, but I think that it is definitely about you knowing you're doing what you can do in your own life. But also, again, you know, somebody just asked me this the other day to like, how do I keep going? Um, because of all the horror, and I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are I did our event right after um, the, the massacre of some Asian Americans in in Georgia. Um, and how do we keep going? You know, and I think it's just knowing that we're doing the, all that we can, and that's different ways for different people, right? It may be writing a letter, it may be donating, it may be going out on the streets, 
but at least we know in ourselves that we're doing something to try to make a difference. That helps me a lot, but that it doesn't mean that that works for everybody. I mean, I think you need to take time for yourself. It's something everybody here knows I'm really bad about, but this thing called self-care is really important and um, people really need to be doing that. You need to take a break from social media. You need to take a break from the news. You need to have somebody you can talk to, whether it be a friend, a family member, or a therapist. Um, because this is real. I mean, especially the way that things are right now, um, to not acknowledge the impact that this has had on our, our souls and our psyche is, is being unrealistic. And so I think it's just being easy and patient with yourself is, and with other people, because we don't know everything that's happening in everybody else's life um, that's led to the decisions that they're making. So I think just being using that compassion for ourselves and other people is, is truly important. Yeah, absolutely. Elise, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing that kind of keeps me going is celebrating the small victories too. You know, um, you know, not everybody is going to hear, you know, some information and immediately change their life. Um, and while I wish that was the case, um, you know, especially like with family members or, or people that you love or are close to, I think it's important to, to celebrate the small things, you know, like um, my sister is uh, pretty much eats dairy free. And so, you know, I, I love that we can do that together and we're always trying to find recipes together. Um, and she's not hundred percent vegan, but she, she's closer than anybody else in my family. So I'm always like excited when I can do something with her or, um, you know, when I'm able to find people in my community who, you know, share the same values that I do and, and, then we can kind of share information together. And I also think you never know whose mind you're influencing or changing. I'll have people randomly reach out to me and say, you know, thanks so much for sharing all that info on social media or thanks for doing, you know, certain things that you're doing because it helped me make my decisions that, you know, I'm now trying out veganism or, you know, different things. And, and I think it's important to celebrate the small victories in those ways. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Elise. Um, so the next question is for big picture change, what government agency, agency should, we look, should we be looking to? And I know we've said it time and time again that we do not rely on the federal level. We, we definitely think that you should be looking locally, um, working with your local community, your local um, and I just went blank, but <laughs> Lauren, I'm going to pass it to you because I just went blank on what I was going with. I think, you know, it's about your city council members. It's about your board of supervisors in your county. But I also think it's things like your PTA. You know, if you have children, being more active in your school's PTA, because that influence that you're going to have is not going to be only for your own children, but children to come. And they need people who are actively interested and engaged and have that time. Not everybody has the time to be a part of that. And so if you do, that is an absolute tool to help try to create change is right there. So I think that we see local, you know, you you know, you can contact your federal legislator, but more than likely you will get a response from your local city council member. And to not, you know, we have the ability to get good people in office and bad people out of office. And we need to take those opportunities as much as we can. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for jumping in. <laughs> um, so the last question is, are, do we have any recommended literature? And so we did cover this um, in the event and we will be sending in our post event email, we will be sending a link to our website um, that has a list of recommended books, uh, which also includes children books um, and documentaries. And so we'll be sending you that link in the email. So just keep an eye out for that. But if you want, you can go to our website, foodispower.org. And I believe it's under, now I'm putting it, I'm put on the spot. Um, but if you go through our tabs, you'll be able to find um, other resources. And that's where you'll find that list of books and documentaries. So with all that being said, please feel free to reach out to us, um, info at foodispower.org if you have any other questions um, or comments, we love to hear from you. And team, if you have 
anything left to say, please feel free to jump in. Thanks. I just wanted to chime in to also say thank you all for coming to our event, for registering, for supporting us in this way and for everything that you are doing um, to, to amplify the work that Food Empowerment Project is doing. So thank you for your support. Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone. See you at the next event. Bye. <laughs> Bye.